There's happiness in having less. That's why it's time to say goodbye to all our extra things. I want to show you how amazing it is to have less, even though that's the complete opposite of how we've been taught to be happy. We think that the more we have, the happier we will be. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I'm 35 years old, male, single, never been married. I work as an editor at a publishing company. An unmarried adult with not much money to speak of. The old me would have been way too embarrassed to admit all this. I was filled with useless pride. But I honestly don't care about things like that anymore. The reason is very simple. I'm perfectly happy just as I am. Ten years ago, I was eager to get into publishing. I wanted a career in which I could think about big ideas and cultural values instead of always being focused on money and material objects. But that initial enthusiasm gradually faded. The publishing industry was going through a difficult period, and for our company to survive, we needed books that would sell, first and foremost. If we didn't publish commercial books, it would be impossible to publish anything, no matter how culturally or intellectually valuable we thought it was. Faced with the realities of the business world, I grew up quickly. The passion that had been burning inside me when I first joined the company began to cool, and I ultimately gave in to the mindset that in the end, it's all about money. But then I got rid of most of my material possessions, and that idea was completely turned upside down. Minimalism is a lifestyle in which you reduce your possessions to the absolute minimum you need. Living as a minimalist with the bare essentials has not only provided superficial benefits like the pleasure of a tidy room or the simple ease of cleaning, it has also led to a more fundamental shift. It's given me a chance to think about what it really means to be happy. I said goodbye to a lot of things, many of which I'd had for years. And yet now I live each day with a happier spirit. I feel more content now than I ever have in the past. I wasn't always a minimalist. I used to buy a lot of things, believing that all those possessions would increase my self-worth and lead to a happier life. At the same time, though, I was always comparing myself with other people who had more or better things, which often made me miserable. I didn't know how to make things better. I couldn't focus on anything, and I was always wasting time. I was even starting to regret taking the job I had wanted so much. I thought this was all just part of who I was, and I deserved to be unhappy. Here's a description of what my apartment used to be like. My room wasn't horribly messy. I could do enough tidying up if my girlfriend was coming over for the weekend to make it look presentable. I tried to set up a cool vibe by arranging displays of my favorite decorative pieces, and the indirect lighting made for an inviting atmosphere. On a usual day, though, there were books stacked everywhere because there wasn't enough room on my bookshelves. Most of them were books I thumbed through once or twice, thinking that I would sit down and read them one of these days when I had the time. The closet was strictly off-limits to visitors. It was crammed with what used to be my favorite clothes. Every once in a while, I would pull something out and think about wearing it, but I never actually did. But they were expensive, so I held on to them thinking if I washed and ironed them, Maybe I'd start wearing them again. The room was filled with all the things I'd taken up as hobbies and then gotten tired of. There was a guitar and amplifier for beginners, conversational English workbooks I'd planned to study once I had more free time on my hands, even a fabulous antique camera, which I, of course, had never once put a roll of film in. Because I lost interest in all these hobbies, there was actually never anything I wanted to do at home. I would watch TV, maybe play a game on my smartphone, or go pick up some booze at the convenience store and drink the night away, even though I knew I needed to stop doing that. Meanwhile, I kept comparing myself with others. A friend from college lived in a posh condo on newly developed land in Tokyo. It had a glitzy entrance and stylish Scandinavian furniture and tableware in the dining room. When I visited, I found myself calculating his rent in my head as he graciously invited me in. He worked for a big company, earned a good salary, married his gorgeous girlfriend, and they'd had a beautiful baby, all dressed up in fashionable baby wear. We'd been kind of alike back in college. What had happened? How did our lives drift so far apart? I bought lottery tickets, hoping I could catch up in a flash. All the while, I carefully hid my inferiority complex and acted as though there was nothing wrong with my life. But I was miserable, and I made other people miserable too. 
I'm glad I threw away a lot of my belongings. I started to become a new person. It may sound like I'm exaggerating. Someone once said to me, All you did is throw things away, which is true. But one thing I'm sure of is that by having fewer things around, I've started feeling happier each day. I'm slowly beginning to understand what happiness is. If you are anything like how I used to be, miserable, constantly comparing yourself with others, or just believing your life sucks, I think you should try saying goodbye to some of your things. Yes, there are certainly people who haven't ever been attached to material objects, or those rare geniuses who can thrive amid the chaos of their possessions. But I want to think about the ways that ordinary people like you and me can find the real pleasures in life. Everyone wants to be happy. But trying to buy happiness only makes us happy for a little while. After what I've been through, I think saying goodbye to your things is more than an exercise in tidying up. I think it's an exercise in thinking about true happiness. Maybe that sounds grandiose, but I seriously think it's true. Why minimalism? When you think about it, there isn't a single person who was born into this world holding some material possession in their hands. Everyone started out a minimalist. Our worth is not the sum of our belongings. Possessions can make us happy only for brief periods. Unnecessary material objects suck up our time, our energy, and our freedom. I think minimalists are starting to realize that. Anyone can imagine the invigorating feeling that comes with decluttering and minimizing, even if there are mountains of things lying around at home right now. It's because we've all been through something like it at one time or another. Think, for example, of going away on a trip. Before you head out, you're probably busy packing at the last minute. You go through your checklist of items to take with you, and although everything looks fine, you can't help feeling that there's something that you've forgotten. But the clock is ticking and it's time to go. You give up, get up, lock the door behind you, and start rolling your suitcase along the pavement with a strange sense of freedom. You think then that, yes, you can manage to live for a while with this one suitcase. Maybe you've forgotten to bring something along, but, hey, you can always get whatever you need wherever you're going. You arrive at your destination and lie down on the freshly made bed. It feels good. The room is clean and uncluttered. You aren't surrounded by all the things that usually distract you. That's why travel accommodations often feel so comfortable. You set down your bag and step out for a walk around the neighborhood. You feel light on your feet, like you could keep walking forever. You have the freedom to go wherever you want. Time is on your side, and you don't have the usual chores or work responsibilities weighing you down. This is a minimalist state and most of us have experienced it at one time or another. The reverse is true, too, however. Imagine your return flight. Though your belongings were packed neatly in your suitcase before you started your trip, everything has now been squeezed inside in a mess. The souvenirs you bought don't fit in your suitcase, so you're also carrying a couple of big paper bags. You're standing in the security line, and the time has come to pull out your boarding pass. You start looking everywhere, but you can't seem to find it. You're getting closer to the head of the line and your frustration mounts. You can sense the icy glares of the other people who are standing in the long line behind you, like your back is being pierced by pins and needles. This is a maximalist state. These stressful situations tend to happen when you're saddled with more objects than you can handle. You aren't able to separate out what's really important. With our desire to have more, we find ourselves spending more and more time and energy to manage and maintain everything we have. We try so hard to do this that the things that were supposed to help us end up ruling us. A day in my life before I became a minimalist. Back when I used to have a lot of possessions, a typical day in my life used to go like this. I'd come home from work, haphazardly take off my clothes, and leave them lying around wherever I happened to be. Then I'd take a shower. I'd sit in front of the TV to catch up on the shows I'd taped, or maybe watch one of the movies I'd rented, and crack open a can of beer. I'd get up the next morning feeling cranky and reluctant to get out of bed. I would hit the snooze button on my alarm clock every ten minutes, until the sun was high in the sky and it was well past time to get ready for work. 
I'd feel weary with a throbbing headache from drinking too much yet again. I'd make my way to the office, sick and tired of the same old commute. I'd go online and visit an anonymous bulletin board to pass the time, since I know I can't concentrate on my work first thing in the morning. Check my email obsessively and respond immediately, thinking that this somehow showed I was great at my job. All the while, I'd keep putting off the actual important work. I'd leave the office at the end of the day, not because I had finished everything that I was supposed to finish, but simply because it was time to go home. A Day in My Life as a Minimalist Since I minimized my possessions, a drastic change has occurred in my daily life. I come home from work and take a bath. I always leave the tub sparkling clean. I finish my bath and change into a favorite outfit for relaxing at home. Since I got rid of my TV, I read a book or write instead. I go to bed after taking my time doing some stretching exercises. I now get up as the sun rises, and I no longer have to rely on my alarm clock. With my material objects gone, the shining rays of the morning sun are reflected against the white wallpaper and brighten up the apartment. The mere act of getting up in the morning has now become a pleasant routine. I put away my futon pad. I take time to enjoy my breakfast and savor the espresso I make on my macchinetta, always cleaning up the breakfast dishes right after my meal. I sit down and meditate to help clear my mind. I vacuum my apartment every day. I do the laundry if the weather is nice. I put on clothes that have been neatly folded and leave the apartment feeling good. I now enjoy taking the same route to work every day. It allows me to appreciate the changes of the four seasons. I can't believe how my life has changed. I got rid of my possessions, and I'm now truly happy. The Things I Threw Away Let me share with you the things that I've thrown away. All my books, including my bookshelves. My boombox and all my CDs. A big kitchen cupboard that had been fully stocked for some reason. A collection of antique pieces, which I recklessly bought at a bunch of auctions. Expensive clothes that didn't fit, but that I thought I'd wear when I lost weight. A full set of camera equipment. Various tools for maintaining my bicycle. An electric guitar and amplifier. They'd been left sitting around because I didn't want to admit to myself that my attempt to become a fantastic musician had failed. A desk and a dining table, both far too large for a bachelor. Even though I didn't invite people over, I had this desire to share a simmering hot pot with someone. A Tempur-Pedic full-size mattress, extremely comfortable, but extremely heavy, too. A 42-inch TV that was clearly out of place in my 100-square-foot room. A full home theater setup and a PS3. These may have been the items it took me the most courage to part with. Roll upon roll of developed photographs, piled up in stacks and stuck together. Treasured letters I'd been saving since kindergarten. Because I had a hard time just discarding things, I took photos of everything that I threw away. I shot pictures of the covers of all my books, too. Now that I think about it, I had everything I needed. A big TV, a home theater set, a computer, an iPhone, a comfortable bed, and more. But even though I had all of life's necessities, I kept thinking about what was missing in my life. I could watch movies with my girlfriend in style. If only I had a leather love seat. I could casually put my arm around her during the film. I probably looked smart if I had a floor-to-ceiling bookshelf. I could invite friends over for parties if I had a grand rooftop terrace. All the apartments I saw featured in magazines had these things, and yet I had none of them. It was all the things I didn't have that were standing between me and my happiness. That's the way my mind used to work. Why I Became a Minimalist People become minimalists for different reasons. There are those whose lives spiral out of control because of the effects of their material belongings. There are others who are filthy rich but have remained unhappy no matter how many things they accumulated. Some people get rid of their possessions little by little every time they move. Others part with their things in an attempt to break out of a depression. And there are also others whose way of thinking has changed after experiencing a major natural disaster. I'm a classic case of the first type. I became a minimalist in reaction to my overly cluttered pig pen. I could never throw things away. I loved all the things I had collected. 
Back when I first came to Tokyo from my hometown in Kagawa Prefecture, my apartment contained nothing but the bare essentials. But because I couldn't throw anything away, it gradually became a palace of clutter, and I could come up with justifications for all of it. It was the complete opposite of how I now feel. But by getting rid of my things, I finally started to break out of that situation. If you're anything like I was, dissatisfied with your life, insecure, unhappy, try reducing your belongings. You'll start to change. Unhappiness isn't just the result of genetics or past trauma or career trouble. I think that some of our unhappiness is simply due to the burden of all our things. The Definition of a Minimalist How do we define a minimalist? How far do you have to go in reducing your material possessions to call yourself a minimalist? But my definition of a minimalist is a person who knows what is truly essential for him or herself, who reduces the number of possessions that they have for the sake of things that are really important to them. The things that are important to you will vary. The process of reducing your other items will also vary. So I don't think there's a single correct answer to the question of what makes a person a minimalist. Reducing the number of possessions that you have is not a goal unto itself. I think minimalism is a method for individuals to find the things that are genuinely important to them. It's a prologue for crafting your own unique story. In today's busy world, everything is so complicated that minimalism, which began with objects, is spreading to other areas as well. It's an attempt to reduce the things that aren't essential so we can appreciate the things that really are precious to us. There are various opinions on when minimalism first began, who may have coined the term, and who might have been the ultimate minimalist. I'm not sure the question matters much, but it's intriguing to think about. Minimalism has been around for quite a while. Diogenes may very well be the ultimate minimalist, it's hard to beat one sheet of cloth, but we don't need to go to such an extreme to experience the comfort that minimalism can bring us. Around 2010, certain concepts began to create buzz in Japan. 1. Donshari, the art of decluttering, discarding, and parting with your possessions. 2. The simple life. 3. Working and thinking like a nomad. The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo was published in 2010 and became a smash hit, and many minimalists have since emerged in Japan. In my humble opinion, there were a few things happening in the background that led to this. 1. Information and material overload. 2. The development of technology and services that make it possible for us to live without as many possessions as we had in the past. I believe these key factors prompted people to start reconsidering the way they lived. Let's look at them one by one. First, there's information and material overload. All we have to do is take a look at our smartphones to get the news from all corners of the globe. We can buy anything we want online, anywhere in the world. We can watch TV shows from any foreign country, not to mention listen to overseas radio shows. The information at our fingertips is increasing at an astounding rate. I heard somewhere that the amount of information that a person living in Japan receives in a single day is equivalent to what someone who lived during the Edo period received in a year, if not over the course of their entire life. The second thing I'd like to point out is that, thanks to the advancement of technology and services, we can now get by without actually owning a lot of things. The invention of the smartphone means we can carry around a cell phone, camera, TV, audio device, game console, watch, calendar, flashlight, map, or even notepad, all in one little rectangle. It's also a compass, train timetable, dictionary, thick mail order catalog, checkbook, or airline ticket. No matter how vigorously a minimalist may throw away their possessions, their smartphone is often one of the last items to go, if it goes at all because it obviously serves so many different functions. More technology helps us minimize. There are probably a lot of people who listen to music only on their smartphones or iPods. I have a MacBook Air, which can be used to watch movies, listen to music, or read books. Though I no longer own a TV, 
I can visit the websites for TV networks and purchase archived programs that I like to watch. Email can be checked anywhere with my Gmail account, and I can work wherever I am by storing my files using cloud storage services like Dropbox. Wi-Fi infrastructure and Bluetooth connections have reduced the hassle of carrying around cables, and meetings can be done on Skype. We live in a wonderful world now where we can work without a physical office at all. Minimalist technology has expanded to include services as well. I live in Tokyo, where traffic is always a nightmare, and the public transportation system is very reliable, so there's really no need to own a car. Car sharing is good enough for me. It's economical. You don't have to pay car ownership taxes. There's no need to worry about paying maintenance fees, and it's easier on the environment. I have no doubt that we'll be seeing more of this trend, even outside of cities, in the future. We're seeing the spread of a new sharing culture with our living spaces as well. There are services available today like Couchsurfing and Airbnb that allow us to rent out our houses and apartments to travelers from around the world. The Internet has made it possible for us to offer our resources to people who need them and to receive resources from others in turn. Considering the rise of information overload, the advance of technology, I can't help wondering if the rise of minimalism in recent years may have been inevitable. Minimalism had to be born, not out of a mere spur-of-the-moment idea or yearning for a new lifestyle, but from an earnest desire and fervent need to rethink our lives. Why did we accumulate so much in the first place? I never realized before that I already had everything I needed to live a decent life. I kept wanting more and never felt satisfied. Often we think that our reality is so far removed from our ideal lifestyle that we must have suffered some misfortune along the way. But all that does is make us unhappy. I'd look around my apartment and sigh. I don't have a nice leather couch or a spacious living room, and I don't have a big terrace where I can have barbecues. I didn't have any of the things that I thought I had always wanted. It turns out, however, that the complete opposite was true. I actually already had everything I ever wanted. Take our jobs, for example. We all work at a company that at some point we wanted to join. Maybe it wasn't your number one choice or the industry that you really wanted to get into, but you needed a job. But it's worth remembering that at some point you really wished you could work there. Maybe the company culture isn't what you expected. Maybe your boss is a nightmare. Even so, you sent them your resume and showed up at the interview not because you had to, but because you wanted to. So in that sense, your wish to work at that company came true. You must have been happy, even if just for a little while. The same can be said for where we live. I lived in my old apartment for ten years. It was a great bargain that I'd found after searching and searching, and I can still remember the joy I felt when I first moved in. But as the years went by, I started noticing how small and old the apartment was, and my dissatisfaction gradually began to mount. Why was I feeling so unhappy when my previous wish to live there had been fulfilled? The same goes for our belongings. Take our clothes, for example. I often felt like I didn't have anything decent to wear. I'd spend my off days shopping and come home exhausted but happy to have found something that I liked. So why is it that I now look in my closet and sigh? thinking that I don't have anything nice to wear. When we look at things this way, we realize that many of our wishes have actually been granted. So why don't we feel satisfied? We all know the answer to that question. We eventually get used to the new state where our wishes have been fulfilled. We start taking those things for granted, and there comes a time when we start getting tired of what we have. This is the pattern of everything in our lives. No matter how much we wish for something, over time it becomes a normal part of our lives, and then a tired old item that bores us, even though we did actually get our wish, and we end up being unhappy. In other words, we can continue being happy if we can maintain that sense of joy that we experienced when we initially fulfilled our wish. If we could just be satisfied with what we have, then we wouldn't have to keep buying more and better things. So why can't we help becoming bored of things that become familiar? Our boredom with familiar things springs from certain aspects of our neural networks. Our neural networks are what allow us to detect variances in different forms of stimulation. For example, 
Imagine the sea in autumn. The summer beach season has long since ended, but you suddenly have the impulse to do something youthful, and you run into the water in your bare feet. The cold water makes you cry out. This is because your neural network has recognized the difference in the temperatures of the sand and the water. But if you stay in the water, you'll gradually get used to this new temperature, and it'll stop bothering you. And you might then say to yourself, Maybe it isn't as cold as I thought. It's the same thing for a person who's asleep on a couch in front of a TV. They wake up the moment you turn it off, and they complain, Hey, I was watching that. Though it's actually more relaxing with the TV turned off, they'd gotten used to the bright screen and the constant noise as they fell asleep, and instantly recognized when that stimulus was removed. Variances or changes are necessary for people to recognize stimuli. This is why we often find ourselves unhappy after we've owned something for a while. Although we initially had a desire for it, our brain recognizes a lack of this variance once we get used to having it. The novelty of the new stimulus wears off, and the item becomes a part of our lives that we now take for granted. Without that variance, we eventually get sick and tired of it. Sadly, whether you buy a ring that costs $100, $500, or $3,000, the level of happiness that you feel is basically the same. You aren't likely to be five times happier when you get a $500 ring as opposed to one that cost $100. Your smile isn't going to be five times larger, and you aren't going to be happier for five times as long. While there are no limits to the prices that come attached to objects, there are limits to our emotions, for sure. If a $500 ring really could bring us five times the joy of a $100 ring, money and possessions would ensure lasting happiness. But no matter how rich you become, no matter how many things you own, the joy from all your things won't be much different from how you feel now. There are emotional limitations to the feelings of happiness that we're able to experience when we obtain something for the first time. In the same way, we also have physical limitations. Even if you become rich like Bill Gates, the size of your stomach isn't going to change. You can't eat six fabulous meals in a day just because you've become Bill Gates. Well, you can, but you certainly won't feel twice as happy as when you had three meals a day. Getting rich doesn't mean that you'll receive a special bonus and your days will become 25 hours long instead of 24. Here's another question that I sometimes wonder about. We know that as we acquire things, we'll eventually end up growing tired of them. So shouldn't there come a point when we realize that there is no point to acquiring something new? Why do we never get tired of this cycle? Why do we continue building our stockpile? I think the answer to that might be because we use the present as the basis for predicting our future emotions. While we may be the only form of life that has the ability to imagine the future, our predictions are far from accurate. Have you ever gone to the supermarket when you're hungry and ended up buying more than you needed? Have you ever ordered too much at a restaurant when you sat at your table feeling very hungry? Your present state of hunger made you miscalculate how you'd be feeling once you started eating. Although we've all enjoyed such experiences, we tend to consider our future based on our present. What does this mean when it comes to our belongings? Let's go back to our clothing example. We go shopping, finally find the jacket that we've been looking for, and we're so overjoyed that we don't even worry about the price tag. It's fantastic no matter how we look at it, especially when we compare it with the worn-out jacket that we're now wearing. We pay for it, take it home, and feel the same sense of contentment when we put it on and stand in front of the mirror. The unfortunate thing is that although we can easily imagine how we're going to feel the first time we wear it, we are unable to imagine how we're going to feel when we wear it for the tenth time, or when we put it on a year after buying it. It's hard for us to accurately forecast how our feelings will change from our initial joy when we buy it, to familiarity, and later, to boredom. Let's take a moment, now that we've covered several reasons for why we naturally collect things, to connect them all together. We have everything we thought we wanted in the past. Everything around us is an item that we had genuinely desired at one point or another. But regardless of the level of our desire at the time, we get used to these items and eventually lose interest. And then we develop a desire to have something else, a different stimulus, 
something more expensive for greater impact. We want more stimuli and continue to acquire more and more. Even if your belonging seems sufficient to other people, your own perception is the only one that matters. You're the only one who can create those changes in stimuli. There are limits to the amount of happiness that you can feel, and a ridiculously expensive item is not going to make you ridiculously happy. A $500 ring won't bring you five times as much joy as would a $100 ring. In the same way that your joy does not equal the price of an item you buy, neither do the functions of that item. A down jacket that costs double the price of the one you already have will not offer double the warmth. Your dissatisfaction continues, and you reach out for something else. You know you'll get used to the next thing and become tired of it as well, but you can't help predicting the future based on your present feelings. You get stuck in this eternal loop, and the number of possessions you have continues to increase. In the back of your mind, you know that you'll never be satisfied, but you keep thinking that maybe this time the brief sense of happiness you feel will be the real thing. With the passing of time, more and more of the items that we own today are used for purposes other than their functionality. Often it costs us enormous amounts of money and effort to maintain these items. These items aren't like the stone tools our ancestors had used, which faithfully served the purposes of their owners. They have begun to turn on us, and they've ended up ruling us before we realized it. Why do we own so many things when we don't need them? What is their purpose? I think the answer is quite clear. We're desperate to convey our own worth. We use objects to tell people just how valuable we are. Have you ever thought about the differences between cats and dogs? Though a cat can stay at home alone and be perfectly comfortable, this is not the case for a dog. Leave the dog alone for an extended period, and it'll probably start barking or walking in circles by the door. It's known that dogs that have been in solitude for a long period can suffer depression. Unfortunately, we're more like dogs, not cats. We've been designed to act in packs and avoid solitude. As social animals, we feel the need to have value to society. We're unable to live without feeling that there's some meaning to our existence through the recognition or acknowledgement of others. One of the main reasons we become depressed or consider committing suicide is that we convince ourselves of the lack of value of our existence. To me, this is a clear sign of how strong the human desire to affirm our own worth is. I think it follows closely after physiological desires like our appetite and our desire to sleep, and it permeates all aspects of our behavior. People can't manage to go on in this world if they don't believe in their own worth. A small amount of self-appreciation and narcissism is indispensable for us to live. Some may say, it's up to us to determine our own value, and I agree to some extent, but if we're completely alone and never see anyone or connect with others, then there's no way for us to affirm our worth. I think that no matter how much of a lone wolf someone may appear to be, there's some level of desire within them to have another person, anyone, turn their attention to them. Like dogs, we simply can't bear absolute loneliness. Our self-worth drives our behavior. You may think I'm exaggerating, but I believe self-worth lies at the base of nearly all our actions. We're pleased when someone likes something we share on social media. We're happy when someone follows us. They've recognized our worth. We're very happy when someone we love loves us back. It's fantastic when the person that we love recognizes us. Or perhaps you're rich and want to make sure people know it. You have a chauffeur, and you have him open the car door for you as you get out and walk around feeling important, wearing sunglasses, gold jewelry, and intimidating others as you're followed around by your subordinates. This is also the case when we say to someone that we're useless. We're waiting for them to say, No, you aren't. You're worthy. Other times, we criticize others, bringing them down to affirm our own worth in the process. Being the social animals that we are, we can't live without thinking that we have value. We can't do anything without a reasonable dose of narcissism. So it isn't a bad thing to think that we're worthy. In fact, it's necessary. The problem lies in how we convey our value to others.
People have different types of qualities. Some of them are immediately apparent from our appearance. Maybe you're slim or cute, or perhaps you're tall, muscular, beautiful, fashionable, or have a fantastic figure. External appearances are easy to grasp. Anyone can understand the message at a glance. But no matter how we polish the surface, there's a limit to how much we can do. There are other forms of qualities inside us as well. We might be kind, generous, funny, hardworking, conscientious, smart, thoughtful, or courageous. But these types of qualities are hard to convey to other people. Unless we spend some time with another person, it's often tough to see their true worth. This is where our belongings come into the picture. We can use items to communicate our personality and our values. Clothes are a good example. A rock star outfit will show that we're not afraid to be different, while a more natural style will convey a personality that's kind and gentle, while casual dress may communicate that we're frank and friendly. And if we're not too fussy when it comes to fashion, we convey the message that we aren't concerned about appearances. A good taste in furniture, a precious antique collection, the posters we have hanging on our walls, the plants that we grow in our garden, all of these are items that convey a sense of our values. The problem starts to occur when we buy things just to convey our qualities to others. The more we accumulate and the harder we work to build a collection that communicates our qualities, the more our possessions themselves will start to become the qualities that we embrace. In other words, what we own equals who we are. Our objective shifts to increasing our belongings, since that's the equivalent of increasing our self-image. As a result, we end up spending an enormous amount of time and energy to maintain and manage all these items that we've accumulated. When we consider these things as equivalent to our own qualities and start believing that they are in fact us, our number one objective will become their maintenance and management. Here's an example from my life. I used to have books piled onto bookcases that took up all the space in my narrow hallway. Yet I could barely remember reading any of them. None of them became my flesh and blood. During my college days, I had been hungry for books that looked challenging. But many of them I just flipped through once without actually reading anything. There were books on modern philosophy and masterpieces of the 20th century, very lengthy literary works, that I never finished reading. It's clear to me now why I kept these books lying around and never got rid of them, even though I knew I was never going to read them. I was desperate to convey my worth through my books. They were there to communicate one message. I've read a lot of books to date. As anyone who looks at my bookshelves can see, my interests are diverse and I'm very inquisitive. Though I haven't read all the books yet, I'm definitely interested in these areas. That's why the books are sitting there on my bookshelf. I may not understand everything that's discussed in these books, but I've read huge volumes of works including an array of publications on complex issues. I'm not very talkative, and I may look like a plain, ordinary guy, but inside I'm filled with all this incredible knowledge. Perhaps I can be described as an intellectual with depth. That just about sums up why I had piles of books stacked up in my apartment. I was trying to show my worth through the sheer volume of the books I owned. The same can be said for my mountains of CDs and DVDs. Ditto for my antique pieces, the stylish photographs that decorated the walls, my tableware, in my camera collection. I had so many possessions I couldn't properly care for any of them. Because of all these things that I had, it was hard to clean the apartment. When our tools become our masters. Our possessions are supposed to be our tools. They were used for such purposes during the Stone Age. As time went by, our world became plentiful, and objects began to be used for another purpose to enable us to affirm our own worth. We are social animals that act in packs. We can't thrive without proving our existence has value. We need others to recognize our qualities so we can believe that our life is worth living. To show this value, we communicate our qualities through our belongings. But when we become too reliant on that method, we end up being surrounded by too many possessions. The objects that are supposed to represent our qualities become our qualities themselves. Then we start collecting more things because we feel like we'll become more substantial that way. All these things eventually turn on us, 
we become slaves to our belongings, forced to spend time and energy caring for them. We lose ourselves in our possessions. Our tools become our masters. These objects themselves have no power. We're the ones who have raised their status to become our equals or even greater. But they're actually nothing more than objects. They don't symbolize us and they aren't our masters. They used to be plain old tools. So why not consider hanging on to just the things that we really need? 